There are two types of dynamically loaded bearings at T-Griggs, mechanically loaded and hydraulically loaded. Mechanical dynamically loaded rigs typically involve rotating or contra-rotating masses, which generate alternating cyclic pulses. The earliest design of this type of rig is the Underwood machine, the original patent of which was lodged in March 1945. It is interesting to note that Arthur Underwood co-authored a paper in 1957 with the title A Million Powered High Speed Bearing Dynamic Fatigue Test Machine, ASME 1957, that was published in. Sixty years ago, the cost of producing a dynamically loaded bearing test rig was obviously something worthy of comment. Hydraulically loaded rigs can be subdivided into two types. Rigs in which a hydraulic pulse is produced by motion generated by the test rig itself, and rigs where the pulse is introduced by a separate solar hydraulic actuator. The sapphire type machine, originally developed by Glacier Metals in the 1950s, is the best known example of the former. The test bearing is mounted on an eccentric shaft and connected to a single acting dash pod, generating a pulse during the compression stroke. This type of machine is typically referred to as a half wave actuator device. It produces a large pulse during the compression stroke, which falls to zero during the induction stroke. In essence, we have an ill-conditioned piston pump. One of the limitations of this type of rig is that the test bearing and the hydraulic working fluid cannot be separated. It is, however, a simple and hence reliable solution. Using a dynamically controlled server hydraulic actuator sounds like the obvious starting point for producing a bearing for T-Grig, providing one ignores the cost and complexity of such systems. If you happen to have access to an underutilized Instron or MTS machine, then perhaps this is a feasible option. If, however, you have to start by purchasing the equivalent of such a device, then you start with a large cost penalty. Then there is the issue of controlling an actuator to produce an aperiodic waveform. We have tried this ourselves, and although technically feasible, the cost of such systems rendered them commercially unviable. The challenge we set ourselves was to produce a compact, low-cost, pulse-generating actuator that could be used to produce a bearing fatigue rig with the target x work selling price of something less than £100,000. A freestanding actuator would allow us to design a deconstructed sapphire machine in which the pulse generation and shaft rotation were driven and controlled separately, allowing asynchronous operation. The pulse actuator is essentially a combination of a cam-driven piston pump, a pressure intensifier and a single acting hydraulic cylinder, all merged into a single assembly. This has the advantage of confining all the high pressure elements of the system within that assembly, eliminating the requirement for external high pressure piping. A small diameter cam-driven piston reciprocates in a bore in a larger diameter fixed piston. A floating cylinder mounted on the fixed piston generates a pulsating force. The ratio of small to large diameter pistons effectively performs the function of a pressure intensifier in a more conventional hydraulic circuit. On the induction stroke, the small piston draws oil into the actuator through a non-return valve. On the pumping stroke, the piston works against a pressure relief valve. The first prototype actuator used a 25mm diameter driving piston and a 75mm diameter actuator cylinder and produced a pulsating force of 11 kN with the pressure relief valve set at 25 bar. We were encouraged to see that we could produce fatigue failure in an aluminium test bar. A second prototype was then produced with a few modifications and a 125mm actuator cylinder. The theoretical force generated by this actuator is 1,227 newtons per bar. 
A 50 kilonewton load cell was used for initial tests in combination with a pressure transducer connected immediately upstream of the pressure relief valve. Tests run at 500 RPM generated a maximum pressure pulse of approximately 30 bar and a corresponding force pulse of approximately 30 kilonewtons. Even at this speed, it is apparent that the frequency response of the force transducer is too low. Following further tuning, the peak pressure was increased to 38 bar, corresponding to a maximum calculated force of 47 kilonewtons. The device is obviously scalable. Much in the same way that the high pressure is confined within the pulse actuator, the large dynamic forces were entirely reacted within the bearing test assembly, removing the requirement for any external high stiffness frame. So we end up with a simple bench mounted rig supplied with hydraulic oil from a low pressure pump. A separate feed system is required for the test lubricant. For partial journal and rolling element bearings, tests can be run immersed with lubricant circulation. For full journal bearings, a rotating manifold can be attached to the free end of the bearing shaft to provide a central oil feed. Having separated pulse generation from bearing shaft rotation, the bearing outer shell or race is no longer subjected to orbital motion, making it much easier to attach sensors and to measure friction. Having the separate control of pulse rate and rotational speed means that the former can be adjusted to give the required fatigue cycle rate, while the latter can be adjusted to control the lubrication regime. So, for example, a rolling element bearing can be rotated slowly resulting in insufficient lubricant entrainment velocity while being subjected to a large number of fatigue cycles. This is how the device is constructed. And here is the rig running. 